Good evening. This is Redwood Wonk. My name is Eric Kirk. I'm with Dave Frank. We're here to talk national news of the day. Um, I do want to make a cr correction to a previous show. Somebody, a, a comment I made on a previous show, uh, somebody did inform me. I had said that there were no black, pardon me, no white um, House members in the entire South. I was wrong. It's the Deep South, um, that Deep South being specifically from Louisiana to South Carolina, not including including Florida, Texas, or either Tennessee or Kentucky. The person informed me there are just not enough African-Americans in Tennessee to elect pretty much anybody who is African-American. So it, but it's the Deep South, um, which they refer to, and it has a specific cultural meaning. So I stand corrected there, other than uh, Doug Jones, but that doesn't count because he was in the Senate, not the House. So um, anyway, uh, I stand corrected. We are, our first topic tonight, we're going to talk about the Ukraine as it relates to domestic politics. As we discussed last week, there is um, not uh, a whole lot of criticism or undermining of the Biden administration coming from anybody in this domestically. I mean, maybe in some of the right and left wing people, we do have left wing people who are, uh, are kind of supporting the Russia, you know, we have Glenn Greenwald and types who've actually supported the Russian takeover of Crimea, and and you have the right wingers who you know have, have who support that kind of nationalism and and uh, who supported Russia for their own reasons, or at least are always going to attack uh, Democrats for whatever reason. But for the most part, certainly in mainstream politics. They've been quiet. Even Donald Trump has been quiet. Um, and to this week that lasts, they are talking about, um, they are negotiating a sanctions bill right now. There is some disagreement about it um, as to whether or not sanctions are going to be applied before or after an invasion. Uh, a lot of discussion about the details of it, whether sanctions are going to include um, the pipeline, whether they'll include businesses that, that involve themselves with the the pipeline that extends into Germany and whether or not they are going to want to demand that the European nations uh, actually shut down and don't involve themselves with that pipeline. That's a big deal for a lot of reasons. Um, and um, <clears throat> but but and definitely there seems to be uniform agreement on sanctions that are aimed specifically at Putin and his assets in the West and um, and and to really make them pay economically if this invasion happens. They are also um, talking that, well, it's already happening. Actually, Biden is already using his discretion to send weapons and, and people to train Ukrainian soldiers uh, as to how to use those weapons, anti-tank missiles and a lot of other types of assistance to um, the Ukraine, probably more symbolic than strategic, but definitely there as support. There is no talk of any Western troops uh, entering into the Ukraine to help against uh, the against Russia. That is kind of seen as their s sphere of in influence. You know, kind of it kind of the same way that Russia would not involve itself in, in with troops in Central America. You know, they their superpowers kind of allow each other that reign, but but only to a certain extent. Um, and so they were, so there are, there is unity around this and so far, no criticism of how Biden is handling it. And probably because there are intelligence briefings happening every day and, um, and may even be consensus on how it's being handled in terms of publicly and privately, and it may very well be that Biden, the administration coming out ahead of time and saying that a false flag incident was imminent, was strategic to prevent it because it hasn't happened so far. Um, you know, the question is whether what Putin's plans are. Is he going to invade now, later? Has he even decided what he's going to do? Does he even have a plan? Um, and, you know, and how Biden handles this is probably going to really have a lot to do not only with our futures, but specifically, as we tried to discuss on this show, politically. You know, I mean, we all want to know how it's going to affect us. We all don't want to die in a nuclear war, obviously. And, you know, probably that's not going to happen. Everybody is really careful about that. The, the world leaders are very careful to avoid that. Even, even Russia doesn't want to start a nuclear war. So they're going to probably be pretty careful about that. But 
Uh, but what what are the political implications? Does Biden look strong? Does he look weak? Does he is it something in between? And and what will be the political implications based on the various outcomes, Dave? So this situation, I think we'll we'll start. I'll start from the perspective of, like you said, sort of the the domestic politics side about the unit the unity of messaging and lack of criticism. Um, I think that that's probably expected and appreciated by by citizens writ large, because like you said, we don't want, you know, United States versus Russia. These were the Russia was a former great superpower, no longer economically, but still with the nuclear capacity to destroy the world multiple times over. Um, so so it's a the stakes are as high as they can be. It's called the great game, this geo strategy. But the United States is really supposed to be, I think, taking the higher ground in most cases, um, just because of our you know, unipolar moment in the world where we, you know, despite all the uh, setbacks and, you know, when it comes to Afghanistan and and the collapse of the economy and the decline of trust in institutions, et cetera, we, you know, we, we've got we've got problems, um, but but we're still the unipower here, uh, the, uni, in the uh, you know, the hege- hegemonic power in a unipolar world. Um, so getting to the, the bipartisan nature, I think a, a proxy for that is uh, I saw Mitch McConnell briefly not not say much. Um, but what he did say is he was expressing general support for the president's actions of raising readiness to high alert for 8,500 troops in the you know in the European region, um, because Mitch McConnell's point that he made was, look, if we waited until Russian troops occupied Ukraine, whether they came through Belarus in the north or whether they came in the uh, Donbas in the south, um, it would be too late. Um, if we waited for Russia to to uh, you know get involved in machinations of intrigue, whether it's in, in you know putting in undermining the government and trying to put in place a, a pro-Russian leader or uh, or the other alternative you know sort of uh, intrigue would be um, to you know get involved in that false flag uh, thing uh, you know uh, operation that was leaked for last week we talked about. Um, so so he just basically general said that generally said that. Um, this is this is a good this, the, the 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 pace and the choice while we are still um, uh, in in the heart the you know the heavy lifting of diplomacy um, that 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 what Biden did President Biden did was about right um, but moreover what what the, the 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 carrots and sticks here the carrots are that you know and we'll get into the details a little bit more but that diplomacy ought to prevail here we ought to be able to to use our 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 rational. Uh, thinking power, uh, you know, uh, uh, and and uh, all the skills of diplomacy to come to a diplomatic solution to to you know some disagreement um, that that seems you know existential in nature. Um, so so what is the U.S. threatening? The U.S. is threatening unprecedented punishing consequences, um, which which like you said that 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 could mean a lot of things. It could be the oil pipeline. It could mean you know uh, hyper sanctions all the way up to the level of uh, President Putin himself. Um, but it's not clear that that Putin is actually an official position. Uh, you know, including him in the sanctions. That's that was really a response to a to a media question. Um, I think the diplomacy is more tightly focused on concrete steps, which we can get into. I mean, we right. can talk about this at length, but but yeah. the, but the question the, is is you know what where do you think this follows through in terms of politics in terms of the midterm where do you think it goes in terms of that and obviously it's going to depend on what the outcome is yeah so so then there's then there's the outcomes right um, so so the U S did respond in writing um, to the Russian demands and basically gave a, a strongly worded um, defense of the existing status quo policy of um, you know. That we are uh, going to um, be in alignment with NATO, and that we are not going to rule out uh, the potential for the future because we have believe. Um, I, I think uh, Mr. Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken, said we made clear that the core principles we're committed to to uphold and defend, including Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the right of states to choose their own security agreements and alliances. Um, I think that's the principle that we're putting forward. Is like, look, we're not negotiating on that. And yeah. that's that's a bipartisan principle, I would say. So there's yeah. not a lot of room between the two parties to criticize. Right. I mean, 
I mean, I suspect if there is a diplomatic resolve, it'll be one that Ukraine signs on to that'll be like a temporary moratorium on joining NATO that Ukraine proposes. That's probably what it'll be. We we'll say, OK, we're not going to permanently agree to this, but we'll, te- we'll agree for the next 10 years we're not going to do this, right? Which probably wouldn't happen anyway, right? But so that, that and that allows everybody to save face because really the issue is, is Putin has to look strong in his country. Exactly. He has to be able to go back and say, I won, right? And, yeah. and, it, and that's all he cares about. So anyway, uh, uh, we have a lot more to say on that. But, yeah. Bi- and, but Biden has to come back and basically say, I won. Right. That's what he has to do for the midterms. We'll we'll talk a lot more about that. All right. Getting into uh, way on a different topic. But um, (laughs) this last Saturday, um, there were, you know, were uh, demonstrations organized by Planned Parenthood and its support groups um, all around the country. We had one right here in Eureka about, you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 people turned out. um, And uh, there was then again a uh, anti-abortion demonstration at the courthouse the very next day. The politics are as contentious as ever. Um, and um, and all about what we've been discussing, the, the cases uh, from Texas and Mississippi that have reached the Supreme Court. Everybody's waiting till the dis- decisions come down, probably in June, which they are expected to basically overturn Roe v. Wade to the extent of which we don't know, um, and in which we've got the locked and loaded um, states ready to basically ban abortion, other states ready to pass legislation to do that, and um, and it starts. And um, and the, um, you know, the, there's fundraising all around that. And, you know, the, the big question is, um, and, and Sotomayor wrote a very impassioned um, dissent um, and, uh, last week and, uh, you know, and, and in opposition to it and made it, made it very public. And it's, it's pretty much what, what has been said uh, all of this time about the right to privacy, about the right, you know, of of individuals to choose against the um, uh, against the the coercive apparatus of the state, regardless of what you know what a religious view uh, is about the beginning of life, about you know the the autonomy of the human body that the state does not have the right to conscript the the body to you know hold another life alive. We wouldn't you know if we if if a life had you know anyway we we they, we. We've heard these arguments. The real question is, is where do choice and and reproductive rights advocates go from here? It's going to be overturned. That does not mean, as some people believe, that abortion will be banned in the country. It does. There's not going to be a, a right to life amendment anytime soon that's going to pass. But there is also not going to be a right to choice amendment anytime past soon or a privacy amendment. In California, um, the, the right to choice and reproductive rights will survive because we have a privacy amendment. What a lot of people um, who haven't read Roe v. Wade don't, might not understand is it was passed under the, the auspices of a, a, a right to privacy. It was um, it had come out of other cases that established basically that you have privacy rights from the state uh, under what was referred to as even though it wasn't explicitly um, expressed in the Bill of Rights. uh, You have the Ninth Amendment that basically states that um, rights that are not specifically stated are, are still held by the people. Um, and uh, and the Fourteenth Amendment says something very similar, and that and, and so then they said, you know, you've got the Fourth Amendment and the Third Amendment and uh, other rights, and it's in the penumbra of, yeah. of those rights. It's it, 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 and and it, it's implied like a rainbow, like a rainbow, a penumbra. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's it's implied by these other rights, and yeah. and those other rights don't it, it make any sense if privacy is an inherent right. Plus, we've had other th- rights. That the Supreme Court and other courts had passed in the in that 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 nobody objected to the even the purists like Clarence Thomas no nobody objected to when they said we have a right to contract we have a right to travel um, you know nobody will co- claim that we don't have a right to think there's nothing in there about the right to think they said well you've got the right to to free press that's not a right to think. You know, and, and, uh, you have your own thoughts. 
I'm going to say, well, that's Orwellian to say you don't. I said, well, it's not in the book, you know, in the uh, in the Bill of Rights. I mean, you're saying yeah. we're limited to that. And and Madison was very clear. We can't write down every right that's there. And we have, you know, it's stated in, in the Declaration of Independence, rights endowed by our creator. The, the government doesn't create rights. It doesn't give us rights. It recognizes them. That's all the government does. And the Bill of Rights, we can't list everything in there. It's, you know, and privacy is one of those that is fundamental. And yet, Clarence Thomas has this view that, no, your rights don't exist until the government recognizes them. Completely contrary to the very, you know, um, the Jeffersonian concept of liberty that he claims to stand for. Um, natural he, rights. Natural rights. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, so anyway... So the question is, but it's being overturned, um, and um, it, it's going to. Question is, where do we go from here? Now, eventually, they want to pass some kind of, um, uh, you know, reproductive rights or privacy amendment that takes three quarters of the states and two thirds of Congress. Nowhere near there yet, right? That's not going to happen anytime soon. So, what's next, Steve? Um, I was looking at some Brookings Institute uh, analysis of this, and and um, you know before I before I get to that though, I, you did you stated a couple times that uh, it's going to be overturned with with a solid degree of conviction for folks that aren't fully on board with that. Um, President Trump did appoint three pro-life justices, uh, Amy Comey Barrett, Neil, Neil uh, Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh. Plus, you have Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas, who are also clearly in that camp. So so it's a it's going to be uh, it's going to happen. There's going to be a, something uh, announced, a decision uh, yeah. that that is disruptive to the status quo, for sure. Um, and so so getting to to this Brookings analysis that, you know, there's a, there were some a couple interesting data points here. Um, one is that the the uh, the schism has grown. So here I'm just going to quote from the report. The percentage of Republicans self-identified as pro-life increased from 51 percent in 1995 to 74 percent this year. The percentage of Democrats calling themselves pro-choice increased from 58 percent back in 1995 to 70 percent. So we've got this extreme uh, polarization where you know 70 to 75 percent of us where we stand depends on where we sit in terms of parties geographically that works out to the northeast and the west coast being um you know basically yeah. majority democratic and then the the vast interior the in the other way around so, yeah, so culture war again co exactly the whole culture war thing um so so this what what will happen in if this mississippi case dobbs versus jackson's uh, Jackson Women's Health Organization, specifically what's at question is that the law says that abortions can't take place after 15 weeks. And right. what that directly targets is the, in Roe v. Wade, is the viability. So this would gut the viability criteria for abortion, um, So the, which has been in place for nearly 50 years. Um, <clears> so then the question is, well, now that we have these, these minority and majority sort of factions um, to a certain extent, um, because, because more people support the status quo, uh, you know, Brookings is saying, well, what, what does that mean for the future? Your question. And uh, interestingly, just like you mentioned, uh, the fe you know, the, the founders, they also mentioned Madison in Federalist 10, who warned of the mischief of faction, where a minority, uh, the, the, you know, it's, it's likely that an apathetic majority will lose out to a high intensity uh, yeah. minority. And, and so the, 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 what I think might happen is once this ruling comes down, uh, we will see um, the complacent majority increase their intensity. And but but what's going to be? You're asking what's the what's the battleground? Where where are they going to apply that new frustration? Where, how are they going to change the, the system once once this case comes down? Um, and it I would argue that it, it's it's likely it's going to happen at the state level um, first, and, right. and and as as uh, you know the tr the states as the incubators of democracy are able to kind of wrap their head around what it means not to have these federal protections, um, then then they'll be able to take tangible legislation that's being proposed in some of these other states. Like you said, California is already you know ahead of the curve on all this, of course, right. but but other states will need to, to sort of look internally. And I think it'll be a battleground, um, a hot button issue um, for, for a lot of folks to try to get uh, greater participation uh, to, to return to that status quo that the majority supports in the country. 
Well, you know, I, we don't have time for me to go into this. I want to take it up on a future show. But um, but we are Gallup does a very nuanced one. They look at it. This isn't black or white in terms of people holding against or for. What well, Gallup does polls where they look at where people support uh, abortion rights and where people oppose it. And there's a big spectrum of people who say, well, I support it here, but I don't support it there. I don't support absolute rights to do it under these circumstances. How far along in the pregnancy under what circumstances do we support late term abortions and there is a whole spectrum and i think that the pro choice movement has made a mistake by shutting down discussions about these things uh, i think that the women's movement have made a mistake by being unwilling to for instance even allow feminists for choice and organ probably feminists for life to even march in their groups just shutting down excluding them from from their groups meaning they're excluding them from the discussion saying you can't be feminists if you don't think with us on these issues um I think this is a strategic error because I think we could lose ground, and this may be why we th th are losing on this issue. I want to talk about that more in the future yeah. because there needs to be a discussion, and we're not having it because we're so polarized. We'll talk about that future show. We saw with our own eyes rioters menace these halls, threatening the life of the Speaker of the House literally erecting gallows to hang the Vice President of the United States of America. What did we not see? We didn't see a former president who had just rallied the mob to attack, sitting in the private dining room off the Oval Office in the White House, watching it all on television and doing nothing. He said that the goal of some Republicans is to, quote, turn the will of the voters into a mere suggestion. And so President Biden goes down the same tragic road taken by President Trump, casting doubt on the reliability of American elections. State the obvious. One year ago today, in this sacred place, democracy was attacked. For the first time in our history, the president had not just lost an election, he tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. All right. Um, next topic, topic that won't die, that never slows down, January 6th committee. Um, it, it goes on and on. I think the big news is, well, the Supreme Court voted eight to one um, to, um, to allow the committee to access to the National Archives of the uh, Trump had fought it vehemently uh, to prevent it. Um, we could go into legal issues there, but I don't even want to bother with it because there's so much to discuss. Um, Clarence Thomas was the sole vote against, which is actually kind of an interesting conflict of interest there, given that his wife uh, actually is paid, was paid to actually oppose that. But we're we, we're not going to discuss that either. We've got so much to discuss here. Um, what has been revealed is among those documents was a drafted order that may have actually been signed, but we don't have the signed copy. It probably got destroyed. Um, that was uh, drafted sometime in in December, possibly by the Kraken Powell, but also possibly by somebody else uh, in mid December, that called for the the uh, the order would have involved the Department of Defense seizing the voting machines in the five states uh, that are in dis were in dispute: um, Pennsylvania, uh, Georgia, uh, Arizona, etc. And to investigate, you know, these machines, in an investigation that would have extended beyond January 6. So, in, I get by implication, there and possibly by follow-up order, there wouldn't have been the transfer of power, or I, you know, it's, it's unclear as to whether that would happen. The next day. Um, Flynn is on uh, Newsmax advocating for martial law, saying, hey, we've done martial law lots of times in this country. It's not what it thinks. It's not fascist. It's, you know, we need to do this because something weird is going on here. Why don't we? And, uh, and, then, uh, and then we're not quite sure what happened in the administration, but the order either didn't get signed or got signed and got, and got tossed aside, possibly because of a revolt within the staff, threats to quit, possibly by Rob Barr. Uh, we're not sure because we know that Rob Barr is also talking to the committee, possibly about that. Um, and then the next night, there was a real frantic, wild tweet late at night or early in the morning uh, where Trump is talking about, you know, January 6th and just go wild. And I, I mean, it's a really strange sequence of events, but this is was basically 
I mean, um, it's about as blatant as you can get um, as to, to what was there. And people want to, well, the committee wants to know, and maybe they already know who drafted the thing. Well, certainly I want to know who drafted it and, um, and, and what this represents. And, and I want to know what type of access they, they had. I want to know if the president at the time did actually sign the thing and wanted to go forward. I want to know why it didn't happen. Dave. Yeah, it was interesting times. I think this this committee will will keep getting new information probably all the way through till November, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view. Um, but but yeah, the, I think the big the big thing this week is that the um, secret White House documents from 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 uh, Oval Office meetings, uh, high level correspondence with like for example Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, uh, meeting minutes, others. Um, those 770 documents may, in fact, be uh, key key pieces of evidence in this idea that they were planning a conspiracy from the Oval Office. And uh, just since we met last, um, Department of Justice Deputy Attorney General uh, Lisa Monaco, um, her her um, you know focus has, and things she's commented on publicly is that the uh, she's investigating uh, doing a crim- criminal probe into all the plan for alternative electors, yes. which is part of part of that uh, uh, Green Bay sweep plan that um, that Steve Bannon po- talked about publicly, and also yeah, several uh, state attorney generals turned it over. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and, and even um, Peter Navarro, also uh, an economic advisor to former President Trump, he also has spoken publicly on television multiple times. Yes, this was our plan. And in fact, even Trump's lawyer, Boris Epstein, a new a new sort of face on the media circuit, uh, came out and said, yeah, this is we, we believe this was the right thing to do. We believe this was all legal. We plan to overturn the election. Um, so so I think that, you know, between the, the sort of the public face of just sticking to their story, um, between that and then what's actually happening sort of in the courtroom, whether it's the Oath Keepers, you know, that might be a distraction, but but they pled not guilty this week um, and their trials will be upcoming, that they were involved in the degree of violence in support mm-hmm. where there's no connection yet between um, sort of these um, – Let's just call them militia groups and their and their activity. Uh, people that actually stormed the Capitol in an organized way. There's no there's no smoking gun yet, but but it does you know it does kind of um, this in the Venn diagrams of this conspiracy that the Justice Department and others the, the January 6th committee are trying to to trying to like piece together slowly. Um, you know, John Eastman is kind of like one of the key linchpins in the connection, conceivably. Yes. Uh, legal scholar from Chapman University, his emails to Mike Pence, Vice President Mike Pence, spelled out and outlined the uh, options to overturn the election. He was one of the coordinating principals in the Trump war room at Willard Hotel. This is the first time I've said this on this show, but it's been known for a long time and I just didn't want to. But, you know, now that it's public and everybody kind of acknowledges that that's what happened, um, he pled the fifth. Uh, Fifth Amendment protections to over 100, approximately 150 questions in front of yeah. the committee. So whether it's Bob Barr going in front of the committee and and saying, "Hey, this is what I know," or some other witnesses, there there will, um, I believe, there will be uh, piecing together of these currently fragmented documents and meetings and and communications. Yeah, and now Alex Jones also pled the fifth to a whole bunch of questions too, and he was of course inciting people all the time. I mean, the whole yeah. time, right, right up until the day before. And 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 you know, I mean, what would the what would that riot and storming have to do with anything? Well, you know, you want chaos, you want fear, right? You want a, a, a lot of stuff going on w- while this is happening. I mean, and 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 you look down at, at the videos of of the administration. Administration, the family, Kathy, they're all giddy. Something's going to happen. They're not just happy that there's a big rally going on. Why, why would that make them happy? There was something, they at least thought something was going to happen or was happening. I, you know, and maybe they're completely deluded as to what it, the effect was going to be. But it's, you know, th- this, and it's really strange as to, you know, the 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 coincidences between these events as, as you're following them. I mean, I, you know, I... <laughs> And, and and as to the electors, I mean, they they went up with a piece of paper saying this is a certification, and and and, th- and their defense is well, you know, th- this was all in the light of day, you know, we're showing it to you, and everybody knows this was theater. 
it doesn't matter that it was in the light of day. You presented something as a certificate. If it was false, it was false. And the law says you cannot present false something to the to the government. That is fraud or attempted fraud anyway. Doesn't you know? Um, and you just you don't get to do that. Now apparently there's some ambiguities in the law. It's not written very well as to what the punishment is or even in that. But still, uh, politically speaking, that's not a good thing to hide behind. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, again, this is all a little uh, preliminary because there's no one's made claims. This, the committee has not made these claims that all of these pieces, disparate pieces connect yet. But the idea is that if they, if enough, and it's not, if you can prove it's not circumstantial, if you could prove that this is a coordinated effort to undermine the peaceful transfer of power um, and you, you submit fraudulent documents and you pre-stage uh, troops with uh, with weapons nearby and you communicate regularly with the vice president and other legislators on the inside of the Capitol uh, during the vote counting and there's just a lot of ands and all these ands if they if it the people have speculated again just speculated um, that Mark Meadows would be the, the the point single singular point of contact for most of the key principles here because on January 6th, he was standing by uh, Donald Trump and literally physically, which is why, you know, whether it's Fox News folks or Trump's children or some of the other folks who really did want to try to have Trump take some action during that, those silent, uh, I don't know, two, two or more hours between when the Capitol was breached and when some degree of normalcy was beginning to be restored. Um, that, 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 I think all that window and, and, and it's, again, this is all um, not, Proven. This is all alleged, but the idea is that this this was um, you know a conspiracy that can be pointed to yeah. as something to, that where we can place blame on Trump and his mo his innermost circle. And lastly, you had Newt Gingrich threatening that when uh, Republicans take over Congress, that everybody in this committee is going to go be jailed for breaking the law. You know they're getting on nerves, but I wonder if that's against the law. Yeah, <laughs> just just saying. All right. Um, well, that takes us to the next topic. Obviously, plenty more going to happen there. We'll probably be right back next week with plenty more news. We didn't even touch on everything. Yeah. <laughs> I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. I, George Herbert Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. So help me God. All right, next topic. Um, this is going to be a big topic, uh, and we're, we're probably not going to be able to discuss everything we want to talk about in it. But um, interesting thing happened in the in the media. Um, I want to break away to talk about. You know, everybody talks about how Trump snapped at the media, attacked at the media, and and now uh, the the liberal elite are being called hypocrites because we're not attacking. Um, by President Biden because he's doing exactly what Donald Trump did and why isn't it as bad? Well, let's let, let's uh, show you exactly what happened with Biden. There were some questions being thrown at him and he responded. Here it is. Will you take questions on inflation then? Let's move. Thank you. Thank you. Do you think inflation is a political liability? That's a great asset. More inflation. What a stupid son of a. Okay, so you saw it. All right, call him a dumb son of a bitch, right? I mean, you know, not not the politest thing in the world. I don't know that you can compare that to what Trump did, but um, but you know, if you want to compare it, that's fine. Uh, I want to tell you, I actually have really good respect for uh, a lot of respect for Ducey and his buddies at Fox. I'm not Hannity. Hannity was morose and you know talking about how this is just you know how horrible this is. But uh, and and some of the other people and Glenn Greenwald saying this is going to lead to violence against reporters give me a break but let's take a look at, at, at how the, the younger crowd at least at fox responded to it i i actually uh got to think i like these people i did not hear that and i went downstairs <laughs> and i uh opened up my phone and uh he did 
And so I, my response <laughs> is delayed. Uh, but, but Sean, and we have some news tonight. Uh, after years of clips of the president and I kind of mixing it up on the campaign trail and during the transition and here at the White House, uh, within about an hour of that exchange, he called my cell phone and uh, he said, it's nothing personal, pal. And we went back and forth and we were talking about uh, just kind of moving, moving forward. And I made sure to tell him that I'm always going to try to ask something different than what everybody else is asking. And uh, he said, you've got to. And that's a quote from the president. So I'll keep doing it. Okay, I mean, you know, I, I, that's a. I think that's really, you know, I, I think it's funny. They thought it was funny, I, I, all in good um, humor. And in fact, um, President Biden actually called him, do you see, on the phone, on his cell phone, personally, and said, you know, it was nothing personal, pal. And they had a, actually a good friendly discussion about it. And Ducey later on in an interview, as, as um, Hannity was trying to, you know, get him to say, make it into this big, awful thing, Ducey actually said, look, he's like facing the possibility of World War III and he calls me on on the a cell phone. I actually thought that was pretty magnanimous, he said. You know, and, and so, you know, I mean, really good human moment here. So I certainly don't equate that to what Trump did. And Trump did it over and over and over again. And what he said, and actually called for violence against reporters. I'm sorry, no comparison. Anybody want to disagree? I and Dave, you want to comment real quick? Um, I, I'm with you that you know it's 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 not necessarily uh, the high point of President Biden's uh, handling of himself publicly. Um, it was it was just sort of letting letting the truth of his motions slip out and caught yeah. on this hot mic. Um, but the way it was handled after that. Um, even though it may have been unpresidential, um, Ducey, I believe, uh, did handle it well. Um, the, yeah. the words speak for themselves. And, and also uh, the fact that he called, and while he didn't apologize, um, he did come, he, uh, I forget the exact verbiage, you, you just heard it, um, yeah. but, but he, he basically said, Clear like, it's nothing, cleared the air, exactly, yeah. which, is, which is, is fine, I would say, under yeah. the circumstances. Yeah, and it was sarcasm. It wasn't right here. You know, it was it was sarcasm. Or, yeah, it's an asset, right? You know, I mean, you know, it was anyway. I but I do want to get on uh, the talk about what is really happening with the media, and I want to talk about the lawsuits against the media, and I want to talk about Sarah Palin's lawsuit, um, which uh, is not happening because it turns out she's got COVID, so her trial has been postponed. She refused to vaccinate. I hope she's okay, um, but uh, she is suing for defamation going back to I forget what year it was, but it was when uh, she had 2011. Um, 2011, a long ways ago, um, she had some ads about Democrats, and it involved um, what do you call them? I uh, the the hairs, what Cross do you call hairs. them? Crosshairs on, on against Democrats, and apparently didn't have one directly on Giffords, but it had it close enough. And uh, somebody in the New York Times had uh, you know commented that 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 the crosshairs uh, map. Um, was uh, basically might have invited the attack on Giffords. And of course, you know, she was seriously um, injured and, and shot, as we all know. And so uh, Palin has said this is, you know, impacted her, seriously impacted her, um, her, her uh, reputation, whatever. Um, and, um, and so she sued for it. And uh, and that trial is about was about to go, but now it's been delayed. Um, seems a long time, actually. Yeah. And and uh, and on on the basis of malice, because you know she is a public figure under um, the um, New York Times uh, uh, versus Sullivan or Sullivan versus the New York Times. When it's a public figure, you have to prove malice, either that it's a deliberate lie or a reckless disregard for the truth. The problem is I, that I think they should have is that this was a um, an editorial, not a news report. This was yeah. uh, and um, and so you're allowed hyperbola, but apparently maybe the way it was worded, it might might it could be construed as having said the truth, and but I guess the jury will have to decide that. Um, it would seem like she would lose on that, but you know I don't know what a jury will say, and I don't know if there are nuances or details that you know that that um, that will come out in the evidence. I don't know. 
uh, but it wasn't dismissed um, in, in a summary judgment motion. So we'll see. Um, so uh, so that that is one. And, and if it weakens the Sullivan hearing, that could weaken further weaken, um, you know, the effect on the press. We also have these lawsuits for, of Dominion uh, against um, Newsmax, OAN and Fox News because they just continued to repeat um, all of these allegations from the My Pillow guy and the lawyers about how they were their machines were flipping votes on behalf of Biden in in the various states. Uh, they were the ones who you know maintained the the, the voting machines in the states. And uh, and Dominion sent them letters saying, "No, we're not doing it. Here's the real information." And they weren't be their side wasn't being presented. They've got huge lawsuits um, uh, going, and it could put uh, Newsmax and OAN out of business, especially since OAN has lost their big platform. But um, the um, and could really put a dent in Fox. Um, you know, it won't put them out of business most likely, but you know, these, these are huge lawsuits. Um, and, um, you know, and, and the question is, is will it weaken again, the media, because the media here it is, they're, they're representing what, what Fox is saying is we're just reporting what's being said, right? Uh, we're, our, our editorialists are saying one thing and we're just reporting it, but Dominion feels like they weren't reporting it in a balanced way. They are presenting it a certain way and, you know, you know, 50 times one way and we would send something and they'd mention it fleetingly, but then, then 50 stories the other way. So so it's you know, um, we, you know they, we'll, we'll see how that lawsuit goes. They've already passed the other state. I don't think I've made mistakes. I mean, every time somebody says I made a mistake, they do the polls and my numbers go up. So I guess I haven't made any mistake. We showed up and we demonstrated that we would not have our voices silenced by a Republican Party that across the country had a singular intention on suppressing the right to vote. Some Democratic senators seem to imagine they could just break the rules on a razor thin majority. Nothing would stand between them and their entire agenda. A new era of fast track policy. The Republican Party moved very far away from reality. And the fact that you got colleagues of mine in the Senate who refuse even today to acknowledge that Donald Trump lost the election. How do you deal with that? Joe Biden is the president we need right now. Battle tested, forward looking, honest and authentic. He has never forgotten who he is fighting for. OK. Updating on redistricting, uh, as you know, as we reported on this very show, um, the gerrymandering in Ohio was overturned by the Ohio Supreme Court, uh, and they have to go back to the drawing board, literally, and uh, redraw the maps there in a more fair manner. Probably won't be all that much more fair, but it'll have to be a little bit more fair, um, and we will see what comes of that. Well, it turns out Alabama... Uh, the Supreme Court there has overturned their map on the basis that, well, they have that. Uh, we've talked about the Octopus District, and uh, and you can see the the old district and and the uh, well the the previously enacted proposal that's just been overturned, um, and you'll see that one blue district on the left that incorporates both Birmingham and Montgomery and tries to incorporate the all you know good portion of the 27 percent of the African American voters into one district where there really should be, if you're going to be fair, two districts that are um, that that you know have a majority African American, so that you have out of the seven districts two majority African American, which will mean there are two Democratic districts because most ninety percent of African Americans in the Deep South vote. Democratic, whereas 90% of white voters in the Deep South vote um, Republican. It's just the way it is. Um, and um, and so it, it will uh, we'll show you, if you're looking at them now, if you on television, if you're not, if you're on the radio, I suggest you go to 538 and check uh, the map in the right-hand corner. You can keep clicking. It'll take you there. Um, the, the, all of the other maps, there are like four proposed maps that show that there are two Democratic-leaning um, uh, districts uh, in the way it will have to be drawn up. This is an increase from the old map. Uh, Ten years ago, they drew a similar map as to one that just got rejected. And you're you might ask, why didn't the Democrats sue back then when the Voters' Rights Act was still intact? They they should have won, right? 
Well, the problem was, was there was a strategy that the Republicans did back then. They immediately requested court approval, might have been a, a federal court approval. They probably had the right judges back then and judge might have changed the makeup. And once they got that approval, then of all things, uh, Obama his de Department of Justice, under the Voting Rights Act at the time, approved it because probably they didn't think it would be challenged. So it got approved. And so for 10 years, you had that one district. But this time around, uh, apparently it, it, it was a, a different scene uh, because of, of the other lawsuits and probably emboldened by the Ohio lawsuit, possibly. I don't know. But they're saying you can't do that. You can't have 27% of the electorate and cram them all into, cram so many into, into one. And um, so Alabama may now have two votes, which means out of this, it looks like, unless it's overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court, we'll see. Um, but out of this, it appears that Alabama is going to now have two Democratic votes, two African-Americans most likely elected. Dave. Um, yeah, so you, you went to the place where um, if if the the decision that says the way you drew uh, to get one Democratic seat, if that is on its face, uh, un, you know, apparently unconstitutional, according to the federal court, that it'll work its way through the system and that the, the decision will will be such that they have to redraw. That's that's why you would come up with the conclusion that they probably get to two. Um, but I found it kind of interesting that um, this may not make it through the courts. Like, you, you know, as a throwaway line, you said, well, the Supreme Court, if it makes it through the Supreme Court. Well, it, think, right, to correct. It, it, it was at the Alabama Supreme Court. So now it would have to appeal directly to the Supreme Court. That's got to be done within the next couple of weeks. They have to accept it and put it in stay on. So, so it'll go straight to the Supreme Court. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that was it. And the okay. Supreme Court has to decide whether or not they're going to hear it. And so uh, we'll, we'll, we should know pretty quickly. So I was under the impression this was three federal judges that ordered the state lawmakers three? to. Oh, I'm I'm probably confusing it with Ohio. Then you may yeah. be right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so under this scenario, um, that what we can look at, and it's it's maybe a broader, deeper talk, deeper look, but um, with, upon appeal, uh, you know, Alabama's the Republican Attorney General Steve Marshall. He quickly appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals, the Eleventh Circuit. And he wanted to stay the ruling. But what I think is most fascinating here is that his <laughs> argument is that the only way to create two majority black congressional districts in Alabama is to make race the primary factor in map making, which is an unconstitutional application of the Voting Rights Act. And so they're looking at this part, Section 2. Um, Voting Rights Act in the past under uh, you know, uh, former Attorney General Eric Holder, um, Section 5 was gutted, which was that pre-approval process where any of the former Confederate states, if they wanted to change their election laws, they had to get pre-approval from the Justice Department. And but that's been undermined. But this this was left intact. This is section two. So I thought it was really interesting that um, that that's their argument. And furthermore, he said um, the order will require race to be used at all times in all places and for all districts based on the political geography of Alabama and the broad dispersion of black Alabamians. It's essentially impossible to draw a map like those presented by plaintiffs unless traditional districting principles give way to race. So I, I my thought is that there, this is this is a dagger plunge dive towards the heart of Section two. And in effect, is trying to say, um, look, you can't. You can't argue that uh, in a colorblind way you could make this possible. Therefore, you're saying that we have to do it in a race-based way, which do shouldn't shouldn't be approved by the Supreme Court or the appeals court. That's the argument they're making, and and so I, I just think it's really interesting. Um, of course, you know Eric Holder, he's he's come out already and said no. The Supreme Court has the tools in place they need to to deal with this this complaint, this argument. It's not it's not correct. Um, so, so we'll see how it goes, but I just think that this is a really um, interesting development uh, because gerrymandering, um, even even um, Justice Thomas, I think, is on the record as saying he doesn't think gerrymandering is a violation of Section Two. Um, so, so we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it, you, there's no way that you have to say that the, that there's no way you can 
um, not have Montgomery and Birmingham in the same district without violating the race rule. You know, to to have you you have to have them both in, or you're violating the race rule. Have them in the same district. That's that's just absolutely stupid. There's no way that you can make that argument. Sorry, right. I mean that's just, that's just absolutely ridiculous because you have to go out of your way to create a strange looking um, district to be able to have to do that. There's, that, that's just that's stupid. And, you know, and, and OK, maybe you do that it, at least uh, in that. So you create a competitive district. Right. You know, right. If, if it's not a black majority district, create one where somebody else has a chance anyways. I mean, Wait, it, yeah, you're feeling me. That's kind of where I was hoping you would go. Actually, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, go ahead. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, so, so, I was just going to say, like, like we have in California, we have, um, you know, a nonpartisan voter redistricting commission. And can you can you remind us um, what the principle is here in California for how you define uh, these communities that become these districts? Well, you've got, interest, a bunch, right? you've got a bunch of different things. You've, you've got the community of interest where you try to keep interests uh, alike, you know, like like fishing communities, farming communities, uh, urban communities and the rest. You try not to do that geographic identification and the like and uh, and and culture and 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 types of things. And then uh, and so you've got that. And also you've got uh, continuity. You're not supposed to create, break things up and, and, and all of that. Um, you, there's an interest in trying to, you know, have more competitive districts. And we have a lot of competitive districts um, yeah. that, are, that are made there. It's interest in, in not having uh, just all of these people necessarily be there. And we have a lot of non-competitive districts, too, just because you got large areas that are just not going to be competitive. You know, so you, you, you'd have to make it look really weird to make competitive and the rest we, we got a bunch of other criteria too but they follow those criteria and the commission did pretty well actually which that. yeah thank you for for that uh you know thorough explanation it it it, it totally makes sense it's one of the things i mean i moved to california uh oh four so uh mm -hmm. you know a long time ago <laughs> and uh and that was one of the first things that i thought when i saw that that was the law here i thought this is pretty incredible this is post gerrymandering and i think that that was you know this is an element of the election reform bill package that congress has been trying to work on and and maybe maybe um it's time maybe it's time for for people to revisit some uh making it a national policy to do what we did here in California. It'd be good. I just wish we'd waited for other states to do it before we unilaterally disarmed. But anyway, <laughs> all right, that takes us to our last um, segment predictions. Okay, Dave, what have you got? Well, uh, you you kind of uh, alluded to to where I was going with this. Uh, I'm talking today uh, about this Alabama appeal. Uh, mm -hmm. When when you called the terms of the appeal uh, a pretty stupid <laughs> argument, um, it's one of those things where you say, well, if it's not going to be the way that I want it to be, then it has to be some absurd way that uh, that is you know bends the whole argument the whole legal structure uh, turns it on its head um, so so what I, my, my prediction is that the Alabama uh, appeal to the to the Supreme Court um, ultimately will they will not get the relief that they're seeking uh, because it is absurd to say that if you you would exclusively have to make every district uh, shape based on race if you disagree with the way that they drew the map. And like I said, the California uh, non-partisan uh, voting redistricting committee uh, commission that we have, that's an example of a different way to do it that is not using race as the primary way to draw a district. All right. Well, we'll see what happens. Very exciting news there. Um, okay, the, the big news today that we did not get to that we will discuss is uh, Justice Brennan, Supreme Court Justice Brennan. Um, Breyer. Okay, Breyer. Uh, Brennan died a long time ago. Breyer um, is stepping down, uh, obviously under pressure, or maybe he decided to do it himself so that there will be time for Biden to have him appointed before um, the Democrats have a likelihood of losing the Senate. Um, so plenty of time to do that. Who is this replacement going to be? Well, Biden has in, in his campaign promised that a black woman he would try to appoint. Well, this is his opportunity. A number of candidates out there, uh, 
lot of people. New York Times is saying uh, D.C. Uh, Circuit Judge Katani, Katanji Brown-Jackson, whom he got appointed to the uh, Circuit Court earlier in the year, very qualified, um, but she is an Ivy Leaguer. Um, she um, graduated from Harvard, and there are a lot of Harvards right now on the Supreme Court of the nine justices, four of them are for Yale, four of them for, are from Harvard, one of them is from Notre Dame. Um, but um, but right now the Democrats are fighting, having to uh, to be look like they're elitists. They do not want to put another Ivy League on there. Plus, there is one who is being backed by House member Clyburn, who basically delivered the primary for um, for Biden um, and um, and also just got really burned. Uh, with the Voting Rights Act, Voters Rights Act, I think you're going to want to go with his choice, who is South Carolina U.S. District Court Judge Michelle Childs, who went to a public law school, um, has a long experience as a public defender. Biden had talked about wanting to have mixed, um, uh, you know, not have just prosecutors and corporate lawyer people in there. I, I, she's a brilliant. I, you know, um, and uh, I mean, it's just everything about her um, it, it says not elitist, um, you know, out of, uh, of the typical um, block and um, uh, appeasing Clyburn and um, and, you know, with, with all of the things, uh, all of the checklist that is needed um, and um you know, also with a, a vast uh, uh, ten years of private practice, and also has been a commissioner and 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 been in executive branch, has a a, a wide variety of experience that she could take to the Supreme Court. That's uh, that that's who I believe it's going to be, but we'll see. But the New York Times is going with uh, Jackson, who is eminently qualified. I just don't think you can put another Ivy Leaguer on there. I mean, I just don't think that the politics of this year is there. All right. Well, that takes us. Well, we'll see if I'm right or the New York Times. I've been right, and the New York Times has been wrong before. But until next time, stay informed and stay engaged. <laughs>